Alright guys, welcome. So let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about generating consistent income with options. We're going to be sharing some key points uh, with you guys that I've learnt um, over the years of trading um, and teaching people. Um, so lots to cover, uh, lots of great information. Thanks for being here. I know everyone's time is precious and um, you know, hopefully you get a lot out of today's session. I'm going to try and make it as valuable as possible for you guys and do also an extended Q&A at the end. So any questions, you know, just fire them through. There's, there's a lot of people here today. There's a lot of questions coming through. Um, you know, I'll probably answer most of those at the end. Um, so if I don't get to your question, don't worry, I will. Uh, eventually, if there, there's too many to get through, I'll make sure I um, get some email responses out to you guys. As I said, a lot of people here today. Um, so lots happening and, uh, and let's get stuck into it. All right. So first off, just a quick disclaimer that any information contained in this presentation is for educational purposes only and uh, no representation is being made that any portfolio will or is likely to achieve profits or losses similar to those shown. Do your own due diligence basically and the risk of loss in trading securities and options in particular can be substantial. Uh, make sure you check out the options disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardised options available from optionstradingiq.com slash risks. All right, so what's the plan for today? So we've got to cover some key points. We're going to talk about using probabilities in your favour, uh, kind of a fundamental concept for option traders. Um, so we're going to delve into that in a lot of detail. We're going to talk about trading delta neutral, sort of how to do it, why it's important, um, and, and lots of key tips and tricks there. Uh, talk about consistency. So these are some of the key things that you need to, to have um, to be successful. So consistency is a big one. We'll talk a bit about that and how you can do it. We'll talk about how um, liquidity um, and commissions and things like that can make a big difference in your trading. So why we will only trade highly liquid stocks and ETFs. I'll go through some examples. And then finally, we're going to go through strategy selection. So we're going to talk about different strategies that you can trade, um, some of the key strategies that I trade um, and how and when um, to decide which strategy to, to put on. Obviously, we've got a lot to cover. Um, you know, if um, any questions, send them through. And also, um, you know, if some of this stuff does go over your head a little bit, don't worry. I'm going to be going through it in a lot more detail um, as we go along. And we've also got next week's session as well and we're going to dive into some of these concepts in, uh, in a bit more detail as well. All right, so that's the plan. So just quickly, a little bit about me. Um, I know I see a lot of familiar names in here today, which is great. So some of you already know who I am and, and what I'm all about, but just for those that don't, you know, a little bit of background on me and my story. So I started trading options in 2004, um, spent thousands of hours researching and uh, live, breathe, eat and sleep financial markets. So I'm kind of obsessed. Um, you know, as I'm sure you guys are as well. That's this is my passion, and, and I'm sure it's your passion as well. Um, you know, I just love the financial markets. I love learning, um, and and continual, continually learning. Even though I've been at this for a number of years now, um, you know, I'm always trying to learn more um, and try different things, and and just continue to improve. Um, I've authored five books, three of which were bestsellers. So the BS Free um, series. Some of you have probably read a few of those. If you haven't. Um, I was just able to give them away over the last couple of weeks on Amazon for free. If you weren't able to take advantage of that, just shoot me an email um, and I can email those through to you for free. No need to go onto Amazon and buy them. I can give those out to you guys for free. So let me know if you don't have them. All right, so the first trade that I put on was on a retail stock and the main reason I entered the trade was because it was cheap. So, you know, I saw that this stock was trading. It was a low stock, the put option. Uh, it was only going to cost me $200 and I figured if I lost it then it was no big deal. Uh, at the time I owned some stocks in mutual funds and I figured if my stocks went down then I would make money on the put. As you can probably guess, I suffered a 100% loss on that first trade. Thankfully it was only $200. Um, you know, the stocks that I owned went down, the retail stock that I had the put on went up, so that was a good first lesson. So I was losing money on my stock portfolio and I also lost money on my options trade. So you know, not a great start. I'm sure you've all been there. From there, I started learning about credit spreads, iron condors and other options strategies. Uh, I was so excited and was sucking up as much knowledge as I could from any source I could find. I read countless books, blogs, attended webinars, etc. All the things you guys have been doing as well. 
um, you know, I had some success, but really I was just a bull market genius. And things were a lot different back then as well. Um, you know, there's a there's a wealth of information out there now, which is awesome. But back in 2004, there wasn't as much stuff online. There wasn't as many books. Um, so it was a lot harder to learn this stuff. You guys are really fortunate if you're just starting your journey um, that there's so much information now and so many sources where you can learn this stuff, which is great. Um, it's almost there's almost too much is the problem now, and that can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, so very very different now. Um, the massive bear market from late 2007 to early 2009 was another eye opener as I took some big losses. So I've I've been there. I've been been uh, it's not my first rodeo, so to speak. I've I've been around the the track a few times. So I made every mistake in the book. Some of these maybe you've made as well. I would have a good winning streak, but then I'd give it all back with one bad loss. You know, that's pretty common. I hear that from a lot of people. You know, I struggled to know when to enter, adjust, and exit trades. I chopped and changed from strategy to strategy. I didn't cut losses early enough, and I wasn't disciplined. So, you know, I learned a lot in those early years, and maybe you guys have been making some of these mistakes yourself, um, yourselves, and, and I've kind of gone through that process and I've figured out the solution to some of these things um, and become much more consistent with my trading now. So I'm just a regular trader like you. Uh, I haven't made millions in the markets and I don't trade, uh, don't drive a Lamborghini. So I'm not one of these uh, bullshit artists out there that, that pretend that they're making millions and millions of dollars, you know, photographs with Lamborghinis that they've just rented for the day, that sort of thing. You know, my whole motto is keep it bullshit free. Um, you know, I tell it how it is um, and, and keep it honest and real with you guys and, you know, I'll, I'll share with you guys some of the bad experiences I've had trading as well as some of the good experiences I've had. Um, but I'm basically just like you. Um, I have worked in the hedge fund industry but, you know, I was never, um, you know, I've, I've never been on a prop desk or anything like that. I'm just basically a retail trader um, and have gone through this journey on my own. My returns average around 12 to 18 percent per year. Um, I tend to be pretty conservative. You can make 60%, 100% a year trading options, but it's very hard to do and you also have to take on a huge amount of risk. That's not for me. I prefer the get rich slow philosophy. So if you're here looking for ways to make 100% returns in a year, you're probably in the wrong place. You know, I tend to just look for that slow and steady uh, gains, just consistently building and growing my account every year. And you know, if you're aiming for 50, 60% returns, from options, that's great. Yes, you can do it, but as I said, you're taking on a huge amount of risk. You have to be prepared for pretty big drawdowns, okay? Um, and also, if you're able to make anything above, you know, 20, 30% per year, um, you know, you're doing better than the great Warren Buffett. So that's, you know, it's very hard to do. Uh, a more reasonable expectation is that sort of 12 to 24%, you know, one to 2% a month and, and minimizing those drawdowns. That's really the key. Okay, so I'm a big believer in keeping things simple. Uh, I've got a little quote here that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So, um, you know, hopefully it comes across in the way I teach things that I try to keep it really simple. Uh, a lot of people have told me I've got a, a good knack for taking difficult to understand concepts and breaking them down into easy to understand chunks. So that's what I try to do for you guys. Um, and, and as I said, there's a lot of information out there. It can be a bit overwhelming. I try to teach you guys just what you need to know, which is what we're going to get into now. So that's a little bit about me. Now let's get into um, some of the meat of today's session and talk about uh, firstly using probability. So using probabilities in your favour is the best method for options trading success. You should aim to generate consistent income rather than looking for home runs via out of the money options. That tends to be a bit of a fool's game um, and typically Broad markets are going to trade in a sideways manner the majority of the time. Generally, that sideways to upward slope is what you're going to see. Uh, and it's been said that 80% of ex options expire worthless. So why would you want to be a buyer or a seller of options? We take advantage of probabilities. Um, you know, you can think of it, we're selling insurance a little bit. Um, you know, generally the insurance doesn't have to pay out. Every now and again, you get these um, the hurricane or whatever comes through the markets, um, and you do have to pay out. But most of the time, markets are calm, uh, and we collect our premiums. And if we do it on a consistent basis, um, you know all those premiums that we're bringing in um, more than covers when we have to make those payouts. 
So market makers know that buying out of the money options is a fool's game, so they tend to trade from the sell side. Now why do they do that? Again, it's all based on probabilities, but don't worry because you don't need to be a math geek. Market makers use mathematical models to determine the price of an option. You guys may already know this. Uh, and for them, knowing the likelihood of a stock reaching a certain point allows them to set a price based on that probability. Okay, so here you have a um, standard bell curve or normal distribution. You know, it shows us that the majority of the time, um, returns or, or stock prices are going to stay within a 1 to 2% standard deviation range. You know, roughly 96% um, of the time it's going to stay within a 2% standard deviation up or down. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. Every now and then, now financial markets, as you may know, is not a perfectly normal uh, distribution. We do have these things called fat tails, which we need to watch out for. But generally speaking, stocks are going to trade within this range, one to two standard deviations. 68% of the time within a one standard deviation range and 96% within a two standard deviation range. Okay, so a lot of brokers will have um, probability calculators and things like that. This is an example of one, you know, you can put in um, your stock prices, your targets, and you can see here that, you know, 94% of the time, this particular stock is going to stay between 98 and 130. Okay, so that allows us to set our strikes when we're doing things like iron condors and credit spreads. Um, so, you know, these are all free online these days. Very, very easy to get copies of these. If you don't know where to find one, just let me know. All right, so that's basically what we're trying to do. And using probability analysis gives traders a very useful tool for determining price targets to trade against and they are free on most platforms. As I said, most brokers have them these days. You know, if not, there's other free ones that you can use as well. The other thing you can do is you can also use delta as a quick estimate. What do I mean by that? Okay, so here you can see uh, some option chains for SPY, uh, and I've got a couple of ones highlighted there. Now, this is from a few weeks ago, but the, the theory is the same, so basically, now, SPY was probably trading around 243, 244 at the time. This 253 call, it's out of the money. If you see that first heading there, delta, it's delta of 0 0.11. We sometimes shorten that to say delta of 11. Okay? That just means that this option has a roughly, it's not a, not a perfect um, estimate, but it's a rough estimate that it will expire in the money 11% of the time. Okay, so you've got a 90 or 89% chance of profiting if you sell these calls. Okay, same with the puts, trading at uh, delta negative 10, 0 0.10, the 225 puts, roughly 90% chance that that's going to expire worthless. Okay, so again, delta is not a, a perfect estimate, but it's a very, very good rough estimate of probability. Okay, you know, as you can see, at the money uh, calls, roughly 50% chance that they're going to expire in the money. Could go up, could go down. Okay, then if you get the, the deep in the money options, obviously probability is going to be close to 100 that it's going to expire in the money. Okay. All right, so that's a little bit about delta neutral, oh, sorry, probabilities. So now we want to talk a little bit about uh, delta neutral trading, which is um, what I believe is the best way to trade the market. So trading directionally is very, very difficult, um, but with options, not only do you need to be spot on with price, you also need to be spot on with your timing. Okay, very, very hard to do. You can be right that the stocks are going to go up, you buy calls, but if it doesn't happen, happen quickly enough um, and if volatility doesn't cooperate, you can end up losing money. Even though you've bought a call option and the stock's gone up, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make money. So it's very, very hard to do. You've got to be really spot on with your timing because time decay is working against you. And as we've got there, volatility also plays a part. So if you're buying those call options, the stock's going up, volatility is going down, um, you know, that's impacting the price of the call option as well. So very, very hard to make money trading directionally with options. So delta neutral um, is by far the easier uh, and more productive way to trade. And as I've said, that's the approach that 
uh, most professional traders and market makers take. All right, let's look at some examples. So here we've got uh, an unbalanced iron condor that is no longer delta neutral. So this was from earlier in the year. Um, we put this on at the time. Delta would have been close to zero. The, this, the index, the Russell, has rallied now up to 1396. And you can see we've got negative delta. So negative 23 delta. It's no longer delta neutral. Okay. You can see the delta of the 1460 calls there is about 13 and the delta of the short puts is only about five and a half. So it's become a little bit skewed. Now you could leave the trade as it is if you want, um, or you could adjust it back to delta neutral. Okay, another important concept that I talk a lot about is delta dollars. Okay, you may not have heard of this concept before. Very, very important concept that I use a lot in my trading, and I'm gonna go into detail on that shortly. Okay, but very, very important concept. So keep an eye on that delta dollars number negative 31,500 basically. Pretty simple calculation, you just take the delta of negative 23, multiply it by the stock or the index price, gives you your delta dollars number. It basically tells you your dollar exposure or your notional exposure to the market. So if I look at this particular iron condor as it is now, it's equivalent to being $31,000 short the Russell, okay? If that doesn't make sense, don't worry too much. I'm going to go into it in a lot more detail and you can always email me with questions as well. All right, but that is a very important concept. So going forward, now I'll talk a lot about um, how to adjust iron condors, but in this example, what we've done is we've left the calls alone and we've rolled up the puts. So we've rolled up the unchallenged side uh, and now we've made the position delta neutral again. We've had the added advantage of bringing in some more premium, okay, because we've rolled the puts closer to the market. We close the ones further out. We're selling some ones closer to the money. We're bringing in some extra income, some extra premium. That delta is now back to neutral. We're delta three, which is very, very low, more or less neutral. That delta dollars is only 3,600. So again, very neutral, very low directional exposure now. You can see the 1460 calls, we're still at delta 13. Now we've got the 1320 puts and our delta is 14 and a half. So very, very similar, okay? Now this year there's been a lot of skew in the market, so you might be thinking, why is it an unbalanced condor? Um, and that's because there's been a lot of skew, so we've had to trade more of the puts than we do on the calls. Um, but I can get into that in more detail. So this now is a much better looking trade. Not only have we brought in some extra income, we've got back to delta neutral, okay? And we're similarly placed um, in terms of our positioning. We've got 65 points uh, until we hit our uh, short calls and we've got 75 points on the downside until we hit our, our short puts. So we're much more central, we're delta neutral, we've brought in more income. Um, you know, this is, this is how you do things on delta neutral trading. Now, if the market had run up a lot further, and these 1460 calls were getting put under a lot more pressure, we could also look at rolling them out further. Now, a couple of just quick rules for you guys. Um, you know, if Delta hits about 20 on either of the short calls or the short puts, 20 to 25, that's when I want to look to take some defensive action, okay? So this could be considered more of an aggressive adjustment because I'm kind of taking on more risk by rolling things closer to the market. A defensive action would be rolling, um, rolling the calls further away from the market. So that's going to cost me some money, um, but it gives me a bit more margin for error. You would call that a defensive move. Okay, but as it stands, delta of 13 is, is pretty good. I'm totally happy with that exposure. There's no need to touch these calls, um, but we've rolled the puts up to get delta neutral and uh, got a much better looking trade. All right, so a good rule of thumb is to keep delta to less than 20% of theta. So again, this is another thing I talk a lot about is our delta to theta ratio, really important concept. It makes sense for Russell, but it doesn't necessarily work for every other instrument. So here's another example of a trade from uh, December 2016. Trade looks good, delta is less than 4% of theta, and vega is only 250% of theta. So they're really nice looking Greeks. So, not only do I look at the actual Greek numbers, I'm also looking at the ratios. If I have a really high 
delta to theta ratio, uh, it means that price or direction is playing a big factor on my, on my trade. I'm not delta neutral. I want theta, time decay, to be the big driver of my portfolio. So I want theta to be as high as possible and the other Greeks to be low. So in relation to each other, um, that's how I want things to look. Um, and I've got certain ratios and percentages that I look at depending on what strategy I'm trading and what instrument I'm trading. Okay, but this trade here, really nice looking. Um, Greeks, we've got delta of negative four. So again, we're basically neutral. Delta dollars, only five and a half thousand on the short side. Delta to theta ratio is really good. Vega to theta ratio is really good. Okay, so I mentioned that those ratios will be a little bit different for other instruments. So here we're looking at IWM and notice that the trade is also pretty neutral, um, but the delta theta ratio is at 30%, much higher than in the Russell and why the difference. So the key here is to normalize delta by using delta dollars. So again, this really important concept of delta dollars. You know, here you might look at this trade and say, well, delta of negative 11 and theta of only 34, you know, that's a much higher ratio than what we were looking at before. But if we look at delta dollars, the actual dollar exposure is actually less than the previous example. So this trade is actually more neutral than the one before, even though the ratio is quite high. Okay, so the key really is to look at that delta dollars number and, and figure out what exposure levels you're willing to take. So, you know, as an example, a good rule of thumb, let's say you've got a $100,000 account, if your delta dollar level gets up to 100,000 plus or minus, that's probably a good time to start adjusting because if the trade continues to move against you, um, you're going to have some pretty big losses in comparison to your account size. Whereas, you know, this trade here, delta dollars of negative 1,400, yes, we've got negative delta. So if the market moves up, we're going to lose a little bit because of delta, but very, very minimal in terms of our total portfolio. Our, our total exposure is very, very low. Okay, so pro tip number one for you guys, keeping your normalized delta theta ratio below 20 to 25% will hold you in good stead and help prevent big losses. Once that ratio gets above those levels, losses can accelerate really, really quickly if the market continues to move against you. So I've seen it time and time again, you know, people have this sort of, this hope, I guess, that trades will come back their way. You know, they don't do things in a sort of mechanical, unemotional way. Um, you know, they let their exposure get too big and by that stage it's too late to really do anything um, and they're just sitting there hoping and praying that the market goes back the other way. So not a great way to trade. The, the better way is to keep an eye on those exposure levels, have um, limits that you're, you're setting for yourself and here's a good rule of thumb, 20 to 25% um, and that'll hold you in good stead, okay? All right, so here we've got um, another concept that I want to talk to you about, which is layering. Okay, so it's a bit of an advanced technique. Uh, let's take a look at another iron condor that has gotten into trouble on the call side. Uh, just have a look at the delta and also the delta theta ratio. So here we're back trading the Russell. We've got delta of negative 85. Okay, so you guys would probably know that's a pretty big exposure compared to what we were looking at previously. That's a big delta. Delta is now the main driver of the portfolio, okay? Delta to theta ratio is really high, okay? It's almost one to one. And you can see it from the, the graph as well. We're getting very, very close to those short calls. At this point, we're really, really hoping that the market um, goes back down. That delta dollar exposure, 103,000 short. That's like having, um, being short $113,000 worth of Russell. Okay. If you've got an account size that's 20,000 or 40,000 and you're short 113,000 of the Russell, that exposure is way too big. Okay. Now, if you've got a portfolio that's 10 million, this exposure is pretty, pretty um, immaterial, pretty small. But, so you've got to have it all relative to your account size. And a, a good general rule is sort of one to one. You know, if this account that we're trading here was $100,000, we've got delta dollars of this trade of negative 113, it's a little bit too high. You'd want to bring that back down under 100,000 at least. Like ideally, you want to get more delta neutral, 
um, but you certainly want to keep it under 100,000. So again, you can see here the, the, the Russell's trading at 13.37. Our short calls are at 13.70. So we're getting very, very close. We're within 2.5% of our short calls. Now another rule of thumb I have, um, and this is listed in the Iron Condor trading plan that some of you guys might have. Again, if you don't have it, just let me know. I can send it to you. If the stock or the index or the price of the underlying gets within 3% of the short call, that's time to adjust. Okay, so I look at a few different things. You know, maybe if one of my parameters gets hit, but the other two or three are okay, I might leave the trade. But in this example, a couple of my uh, parameters have been hit, I'm within 3%, my delta dollars is too high, my delta theta ratio is too high, the delta of that short call is going to be up above 20, you know, I'm definitely looking to adjust this trade, okay? But what I want to talk about is layering. So what if we did something different, okay? What if instead of going in with our full position size of 10 contracts to start with, what if we started with five contracts, okay? And then the following week we get into another trade for five contracts. So we split up our entry points. It's called layering, okay? So you could do it 50-50, you could do it 25%, you could do it however you want, okay? So a good way to do it is to be consistent. So we talked a little bit about that um, and, and to have a plan, all right? So let's say with this trade, instead of going in with our initial 10, we went in with five, okay? So could have started the trade with five contracts and then added another five the following week after the market has moved. So while this trade is still under pressure, it's under much less pressure than the initial trade. So we go in with those five contracts to start with, market moves up, we add another five at a delta neutral level, okay? So this is what the trade would look like if we had it done that. Look at that delta uh, dollars, much, much lower in this case, okay? Delta is still pretty high, we're still not neutral, we're negative 44 on delta, negative 59,000 delta dollars. It's still a pretty decent exposure size, but it's much better than the previous one. So that's where layering can be quite good. Um, you know, possibly still be looking to adjust this because our delta theta ratio is around 40, 45%. So that's pretty high. You know, these 1370 short calls, you know, they're within 3%. So maybe I'd want to take some defensive action and roll these out. But the point here is by layering the trades, going in with five contracts to start with and then another five the following week, the trade's under much less pressure. So really, really good uh, tactic that you guys can do and particularly um, in this low volatility environment, really important to be layering your trades. You don't want to go bang and just you know, put on a massive position size on day one, then all of a sudden the market drops two or 3% the next day, you're in real trouble, right? But if you go in with a small position size, you wait a couple of days, then you add a little bit, you wait a couple of days, you add a little bit, and you do it on a consistent basis, it's a really, really nice way to trade in this low vol environment. Okay, so here's what the trade looks like from our risk graph perspective when we've layered the trade. So rather than having you know, this huge amount of risk on the upside, we've actually staggered it a little bit. And what we could also do here is we could, some of these under pressure puts, we could roll them up a little bit to help the trade. Um, you know, we could maybe take some defensive action and roll these calls out a little bit. But generally by layering the trade, we've got a much better looking trade, both in terms of our Greeks and our risk graph. Okay, so here's an example of what that might look like. So if we can do this on a consistent basis, periodically we're opening a new condor, okay? And, and it's like kind of floating on the waves in the ocean. The wave goes up, uh, our call strikes and our put strikes go up. The wave goes down, you know, we bring our strikes down and we're just moving with the market, the gyrations of the market, okay? So really, really important concept. You know, sometimes some of our trades are going to get under a little bit of pressure um, and by helping, by layering, the new trades that we're putting on are not under pressure and then the market comes back uh, and moves back into the centre of our structure, okay? All right. 
So consistency, really, really important. So a good thing to do if you want to start layering your trades is just doing them, um, you know, every Monday. I'm going to put on a new condor. I'm going to use, you know, 25% position size. And every Monday I'm going to put on a new condor, 25%. Just do it really consistently. You know, that way if you get a vol spike and you've got a position on, yeah, it's going to hurt your initial position, but you're also maybe adding a new position and taking advantage of that higher vol. Okay, and it just takes the, um, it becomes mechanical. Okay, so that's really, really important is to, to, you know, as you guys probably know, trading and the stock market and following all these stocks, it can be, can be an emotional roller coaster. Okay, so one way to negate that um, emotional factor is to be really mechanical and just say, right, every Monday, um, an hour after uh, the market open, I'm going to open a new iron condor and I'm going to do it at delta 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever you want to do. And every Monday you just do the same thing. And over time, that probability again that we talked about is going to work in your favor. Some of the trades might lose, but most of them, you know, 90% of the time, those trades are going to win. Okay. And just be really mechanical about it. Take the thought process out of it. Um, and also with your adjustments, some of those rules we talked about, you know, delta hits 20 of the short call or 25, I adjust, um, you know, the 3% rule, um, delta theta ratios, things like that. Um, just be really mechanical about it and consistency as well. So one of the keys to success in any field really is to develop consistency, consistency in thoughts and actions. Right? If you apply the principle of consistency to your trading, you'll find it has the power to take you to the next level of success that I'm sure you're all seeking with your trading. So consistency is one of the key things that I preach to all my students. Decide what your goals are over the next few months and work consistently to achieve them. Do something every day to work towards your goals. Now, some of the things um, you should be doing as well is keeping a trading journal and a trading log. Okay, so this is another really important thing is to just consistently track all your trades. You know, if you're not tracking your trades and reviewing them consistently, how do you know what's working and what's not working? How do you know the areas where you need to improve or the areas where you need to tweak things a little bit? Okay. You don't want to get all motivated after this, this webinar and say, right, I'm going to start doing um, condors every Monday. And then you do it for two or three weeks and then you forget about it. You know, the kids get sick or, or something comes up at work or whatever. Um, and then you forget about it for a while, you know, you want to do it really consistently, okay? So consistency leads to habits. Habits form the actions we take every day and action leads to success. I really can't stress it enough, consistency is the key. Um, you know, not only consistency in your actions, consistency in your strategies as well. Don't, you know, one of the other big mistakes I see people make is chopping and changing from strategy to strategy, you know. Um, you know, I've spoken to guys and they're, they're always, um, there's, there's certain guys and they're like, oh, have you seen this? Have you tried this? And have you done this? And, you know, there's so many different things out there and there's so many different ways to trade. You know, um, pick something and stick to it, okay? There's, there's lots of ways to make money in the market. But my recommendation, and it doesn't have to be this method, is to just pick something and stick with it and be consistent. So that's really important. All right, so another really, really important thing when it comes to trading options that, you know, some people may not realize, they may not um, give it as much credence as it deserves, but it's liquidity. It's so, so important, okay? Slippage and commissions can seriously add up in this game. Thankfully, in the last decade, these have both come down significantly. So with all these technological improvements, um, you know, a lot of a couple of new brokers coming out now with really really competitive commission rates, um, so that's really helping retail traders uh, participate in strategies that were previously only available to banks, hedge funds, and market makers. But still, you need to be smart about it. Okay, so um, liquidity has really tightened up, so that helps us trade more instruments. Um, commissions have come down a lot, so that helps us trade different strategies that are a bit more commission intensive. Okay. 
So again, looking at our uh, SPY options that we had earlier, SPY is probably uh, the most actively traded instrument and it also has uh, the most actively traded options. So you could do worse than, than just trading SPY. If you're starting out and you want to start small and you want to pick one instrument and just trade one lot uh, and, and, and just start really, really small and just do that you know, every Monday, open a new condor, you do worse than looking at SPY, okay? Now look at the, uh, the boxes on the right there. We've got the bid, the mid, and the ask, okay? So very, very tight spreads here. That, that, uh, the calls there, we've got a bid of 49 and a bit of 51, the midpoint of 50. So we've got a, a two cent spread, okay? So it's not gonna cost as much to get into a trade, okay? We're not gonna be, um, you know, one of the keys with trading options is getting good fills. You can lose a lot of money if you don't get filled near the midpoint and you're, you're behind the eight ball from, from day one with a trade, okay? But with SPY, you know, even if you don't get filled exactly at 50 at the midpoint, maybe you get filled at 49, you know, one cent or, or one dollar per contract is not going to break the bank, okay? So really, really important, particularly if you've got a small account size, is to start trading with liquid options. Don't, you know, be looking for all these fancy stocks and, and ETFs and things um, just because you have a particular opinion on them. Um, you know, check out the liquidity first. If the liquidity is no good, just stay away from it. Okay, here's an example. Um, again, SPY, you also want to look at the bid-ask spread and here you want to look at the, vol, uh, the volume, so that vol column there. This is the daily volume and the open interest. So a huge amount of volume in all of these uh, option strikes here, okay? A lot of volume each day, which means um, a lot of liquidity, okay? Very, very easy to get fills and, and generally easy to get filled at good prices. Open interest you want to look at as well. Now, you don't want something that has open interest of 10 contracts if you're going to be trading 20 contracts because all of a sudden you're the, you're the open interest in the whole, uh, the whole strike and the market makers can almost set whatever price they want um, because there's nobody else trading it, right? So here you can see SPY very, very liquid and if we compare it to something else, uh, now, IYT, very popular um, ETF, transport ETF, but look at this volume. Very few contracts being traded every day. You know, some of these strikes not traded at all, okay? Open interest, zero in some cases. Now, you don't want to go in and trade 10, 20 lots here because, as I said, all of a sudden you're the entire open interest. If we look at the, uh, the 169... Um, Puts, for example, the bid and the ask, we're now looking at 70 and a dollar 20. So SPY, if you remember, had a two cent spread. This one's got a 50 cent spread, okay? So the chances of you getting filled at exactly the midpoint on this trade when there's no volume and no open interest, very, very unlikely. So the midpoint would be about 95, right? If you put your order in to sell this put at 95 cents, I can almost guarantee you're not going to get filled. You're going to have to drop it to 90, 85, maybe even 80, okay, to get filled. Now, all of a sudden, if you're selling that option for 85 when the midpoint, or say 80, when the midpoint's 95, for one contract, you're already down 15 bucks, okay? Now, if you're trading 10 contracts, you're down 150 bucks right out of the gate. Now, don't forget, it's not just the entry, it's also the exit. So you're trading those 10 contracts, entry, exit, you're down 300 bucks, okay? So you've got to make at least $300 on the trade just to get back to even. Just, just don't do it. There's no point trading this stuff, okay? You know, you might have an opinion on the transports or, or any of these other ETFs, but if there's no volume, there's no open interest and there's no liquidity, just stay away from it, okay? Now, don't forget that $300 we're talking about, that doesn't include adjustments. So what if you've got to adjust the trade once or twice? You know, all of a sudden you're down 450 or $600 if you're making two adjustments. It's impossible to come back from that, okay? So very, very important, particularly, as I said, guys with smaller account sizes have to stick to the liquid um, instruments. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about strategy selection. Okay, so option trading is all about volatility. Okay, really, really important to get your head around volatility. Again, we'll go over this in a lot more detail, um, but just like stocks, we want to buy low and sell high. So obviously at the moment, volatility is very, very low. Okay. So when volatility is low, we want to be long volatility, i.e. when we want to own volatility. We want to be a buyer of volatility, which is also known as being long vega. Okay. When volatility is high, we want to be short volatility. In other words, we want to sell volatility, also known as short vega. Now, it's not to say you can't make money in a low vol environment um, trading short vol strategies, because actually they've done really, really well this year, because volatility has just continued to be low. Okay, the key is um, the difference between the implied volatility and the realized volatility. So if you're selling volatility when volatility is really, really low, as long as the realized or the actual volatility over the course of the trade stays low, you're fine. But if you're selling vol when implied volatility is low and realized or actual volatility ends up being really, really high, the trades are going to be under pressure. So typically in these low vol environments, now we always generally are going to be uh, a net short volatility, okay? But when volatility is really, really low like this, we want to hedge our bets a little bit just in case we get a vol spike. So we want to skew the portfolio a little bit by adding in some long volatility trades. So, you know, what I've been teaching over the last couple of months is, yes, we want to continue to trade the condors and trapdoors and things like that and these short vol trades, but we want to offset that risk a little bit by having um, some long volatility trades in there as well, just in case we get a vol spike. Now, vol, uh, the VIX, um, I don't know where it finished up today, but it's down below 10, um, very, very low. Um, you know, there's talk of it even dropping below 9 potentially. Now, that's not a time when I want to be aggressively short volatility because it's not going to take much. You know, a 1%, 2% sell-off, you know, volatility could spike from, um, you know, 9 up to, to 12, 15, something like that. All of a sudden, those short Vega trades are under a bit of, in a bit of trouble. Okay, so a couple of things we're doing at the moment layering our trades, as I said, so not going all in uh, on day one. So we're layering our exposure a little bit. We want to continue to trade that short vol, but we want to just be a little bit conservative. And also we want to have a little bit of long vol in the portfolio, okay? So in terms of um, a portfolio allocation, this is an example of how you could set things up. So we've got their trading capital. 40%. Okay, so let's assume we've got a $100,000 portfolio. We want to allocate about 40000 to trading. So that's things like condors, trapdoors, bearish butterflies, um, you know, all of those speculative um, or, or income trades, sorry. We want to have about 10% in speculative positions in hedging. So, you know, we might have some straddles, um, some directional butterflies, some directional credit spreads. Um, you know, those, those non-neutral positions um, and also our hedges. So we're going to have some long vol in there. We might have some long straddles, um, some calendar spreads, which are long volatility. Uh, we want to have at least 10% in cash. Um, you know, I, I tend to have quite a lot in cash um, because just by my nature, I'm quite conservative. I don't want to take on too much risk. I never, would never have 100% of my portfolio um, allocated in the market. I've always got some dry powder. Um, for adjustments or to take advantage of um, opportunities that come up. Okay, so we always want to have some cash and then we want to have, um, you know, another 40% in our long-term portfolio or what I would call investing capital. Okay, so generally speaking, the markets go up over time. So we want to have some exposure to that. Yes, we want to trade our, our condors and things like that and we want to have our options trades, but we also want to have some long exposure in the market. Um, so that's, you know, great strategies that you can do there is, you know, buying some Dow stocks that play good dividends and just writing covered calls over them. There's a strategy I teach called the wheel, um, which is a really powerful strategy using um, cash secured puts and covered calls. Okay, so we want to have a little bit of capital that's just sitting there and is just generally going to appreciate as the market goes up. Okay, and that way, 
you know, if if things go bad with our condors um, or some of our other income trades, you know, hopefully we're making money on our investing capital. We're getting dividends and covered calls. We're bringing in some income as well. Um, and then sometimes if the market's going down and we're losing money on our investing capital, you know, hopefully we're taking advantage of that high vol um, and making some money with our condors and other strategies. Okay. So you want to diversify a little bit. Okay, so here's an example in terms of strategies. Again, same 40%. We've got our condors, trapdoors, bearish butterflies. Um, then our 10%, we might be trading you know, diagonal spreads. Weekly butterflies is another good one that I use. So directional butterflies as well. Um, and straddles and strangles. So again, those are our, our long vol trades. 10% in cash. And then the other, the 40% in, in wheel trades, as I said, and leap diagonal. So you might have heard the term poor man's covered calls is another really great strategy. You're basically um, buying a long-term deep in the money call and you're selling monthly covered calls against it. Okay. Now you can adjust these percentages as well. This is just an example. So again, when volatility is really, really high, you know, maybe you want to be trading more of your short vol trades, your condors. You might want to up that to 50% or something like that. Have a little bit less in your investing capital if markets are they're going into a bear market, um, you know, if, if vol's really, really high, you want to cut back on your long vol trades, on your straddles and strangles and things like that. So it's just an example of how I would sort of start my base case um, and then I'll adjust things from there depending on what the market's doing. All right, so just putting that into practice, um, another thing that's really, really important is to, you know, not only look at and analyze each individual position, you want to look at your portfolio as a whole. Okay, so I'm going to go through a couple of examples here. We might have um, a trade here, um, pretty standard Condor. It's moved up a little bit. We've got a little bit of negative delta, but all totally fine. You know, the delta of our short calls and puts is around 11, 12. That's fine. You know, delta dollars is fine. Our delta to theta ratio is fine. Okay, 10, 10%, 11%. Okay, so we take that. Our condor position, you know, maybe at the same time we've also got a trapdoor position on. If you, know, you guys don't know what that is, it's kind of a, um, a trade that I've developed um, as a, a variation on a condor um, because this market's been rallying so much. People have been getting into a lot of pressure um, on their call spreads on their condors, okay? People, when they first hear about condors, they, they start thinking about, um, you know, they're worried about the puts. They're worried about the market tanking. Uh, and hurting their put spreads, but really in the last you know five six years the market's been on this really nice bull rally. Um, it's it's been the call side that has got the people into a lot of trouble. So I've developed this trade that's been working really really well. Um, you know you can see on the call side we've only got the two contracts. So if the market rallies we're not going to get into too much trouble. Um, and this trade's worked really really well. You know, we've got a little bit less income potential, but we've also got this nice profit zone on the downside that the market can sometimes drift down into. Um, so this trade is really um, what I would call a lower risk, lower return version of a condor. Um, you know, the returns are maybe not quite as high, um, but the risks are a lot less. Um, and also it's a lot slower moving. It doesn't need as much adjusting as a condor. Um, so if you put this trade on in a condor, and we've done lots of case studies on this, um, you know, you, you, the market might rally or it might go down and, uh, and your condor needs adjusting but the trapdoor is actually okay. So this one's been really, really good. So, you know, we might have the, the condor, we might have a trapdoor and we might also have a bearish butterfly which is another strategy that I use. Okay, so again, you know, looking at this trade, um, you know, this is a pretty standard setup. Um, you know, really nice looking trade, no worries here. So again, you know, we've got, say, these three positions on. We're looking at them individually. You know, is the position okay? Do I need to adjust it? Um, are the Greeks okay? Does the graph look okay? So we look at them individually and we adjust if needed. And what we also do is we look at the portfolio as a whole. Okay, so you might say, well, gosh, you've got, you've got three different trades on the Russell all in the same expiry. Doesn't that get confusing? And I, I kind of say not really because I track them all separately. Um, you know, this is from Interactive Brokers Risk Navigator. I have these set up um, all as individual trades. And then if I go to the next screen, 
what I do is I combine them all together. And yes, it might look a little bit confusing. You know, you've got lots of different strikes in here, lots of different um, contracts. But I know if I split these all out into the individual strategies, it's very easy to look at um, and very easy to, to monitor and, and know how to adjust each individual strategy. So, you know, again, I look at the three positions individually, then I combine them all and I look at them in total. And I'm looking at the graph. Does the graph look okay? So that blue line obviously is our expiration graph uh, and the purple line is, is a week or a couple of weeks from um, today or the t at the time. So again, I'm looking at the graph. Does it look okay? What's the worst that can happen? What's going to happen if the market goes down 3-4% in the next couple of weeks? You know, on the purple line, we're okay. What if it goes up 3 or 4%? Again, you know, we're okay. We're in a little bit of a loss situation, um, but you know, we're not too bad. Okay. Now that would be a different story if Delta dollars was a lot different, but this trade um, or this portfolio is still pretty much neutral. Okay. So yes, we've got a little bit of short Delta here, negative 17, but again, that's totally fine. If we look at it in comparison to our Theta, we're less than 10%. So that's really good. That's more or less neutral. Delta dollars, negative 23,000. Again, if we're looking at a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, we're 23% exposed on the downside. It's not a huge exposure. Now, if this was getting up to negative 100,000, as I said before, sort of that one-to-one -one ratio, that's when you'd want to look to adjust. Now, again, key concept here, your three individual trades might look okay per all the risk parameters for those trading strategies. But when you combine them all, for example, if you've got three trades that are all short delta, the individual trades are okay, but when I look at the whole portfolio, my delta is too high. You know, say this delta dollars was at negative 100,000. Then I'd go back and say, well, okay, my three individual trades are okay, but my portfolio as a whole is in trouble or, or overexposed. So I'm going to adjust one of those particular trades to get the portfolio back a little bit closer to neutral, or I'm going to add a new trade that has positive delta to help bring the overall portfolio delta down. Okay, so that's a really important concept there um, in terms of trading delta neutral and how I look at things. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much all I've got for today, guys. I hope you've um, really enjoyed the session. I'll obviously stick around and we'll do some questions. I know there's been some questions coming through, um, and if I don't get to your question, I'll definitely answer it on email. Um, all right, so fire them through. I'll, I'll just go to the top and, uh, and start going through some of these questions. Yeah, how do we trade the current uh, market based on low volatility? Hopefully we covered a bit of that. So again, in that portfolio allocation, you know, with low vol, we're, we're number one, we're layering our trades, so we're not getting too much exposure in one go. Uh, and we're also adding some hedges in there with some long Vega trades, long volatility. So long straddles, calendar spreads, that sort of thing. Uh, Delta dollars, yeah, figure that one out, that's good. Um, which platform am I using? So this is Interactive Brokers, so a lot of brokers will have similar stuff. Um, I, I really like Interactive Brokers with their Risk Navigator. Um, you know, if you're in the US, Think or Swim has some, some similar stuff. I think it's called the Analyze tab, you know, very, very similar. Um, you know, Think or Swim is probably a slightly better broker than um, Interactive, um, but unfortunately they don't allow accounts in Australia. So I'm, I'm with Interactive Brokers, been with them for years and, and really like them, really happy with them. You know, if you're using anyone else, you know, Scott Trade, Options Express, any of these ones, Options House, E-Trade, you know, probably you want to look at switching over to Think or Swim or Interactive. You know, the commissions are a bit better um, and the, the functionality is a lot better as well, so keep that in mind. Um, all right. Yeah, Broken Wing Butterfly. So, yeah, again, it's another trade that I do use from time to time. It's not really what I would call one of my core strategies. Um, I use um, some put ratio spreads as well, which you guys might have read about on the blog recently. Um, but yes, Broken Wing Butterflies is another good strategy for sure, but I haven't got any information on that one today, um, something that we can cover uh, later. Uh, when is the next coaching program start date and how much? So I'm going to go over that next week. Um, so make sure you attend next week. I've got um, a, a special offer for you guys that attend. Um, 
yeah, we're going to be looking at some of the trades that I've done this year and some of the case studies that we've been doing in the course and also talking about what I'm um, doing for the remainder of the year um, and then also um, we'll open up the course for you guys next week. So stay tuned for that. Uh, how much time do the options have when you open up the condor? So, okay, so great question there from Pete. Um, you know, typically a lot of condor traders are just going to do a monthly trade. So, you know, roughly 30 days to expiry. Another thing that I've found working really well in this low vol environment is actually going further out in time. So, you know, typically in the past I would have done, you know, your standard monthly condor. What I've been doing now is going out to like a 60 day or even a 90 day to expiry condor. And what I've been finding, um, and this is particularly good for me being based in Australia, um, you know, for me here the markets are open 11.30 p.m. till 6 a.m. So, you know, I can't be stuck in front of a computer screen all night. Like I need to sleep, it's just not going to happen, right? So going further out in time, the trades move a lot slower. So again, we've done lots of case studies on this. Um, you know, we'll open up a condor on the same day, we'll look at a 30-day condor and a 60-day or a 90-day condor and, you know, the market moves, the 30-day condor, our risk parameters will get hit and it needs to be adjusted, whereas the 90-day condor is okay and we can leave it. So, you know, that's worked really, really well for me. You know, I haven't had to get up in the middle of the night to adjust trades. It does happen every now and then, um, but really over the last couple of years that I've been back in Australia, <clears throat> you know, that sort of longer term trade has actually worked really, really well. Um, particularly in this sh low vol environment, if you're trading a 30 day condor, you have to bring your strikes really, really close to the market and it doesn't take much of a move before that trades under pressure. Moving further out in time, you can also move your strikes out a little bit, a little bit more margin for error, um, a little bit more flexibility in the trade. Uh, what do I use for my trading journal? So I just track everything sort of in Excel. Um, and I also have like a Word document that I write down notes every week. Um, and I have obviously um, the website where I kind of track my trades as well um, in these case studies. Um, and, and what I teach everyone is um, similar to what we've looked at today on the slides is, you know, whenever you enter a trade, you have a little bit of commentary about, you know, why you're entering the trade, what you're expecting to happen, when are you going to adjust it, when are you going to take your loss, when are you going to take profit, and then you take um, screenshots. So you're taking screenshots of the Greeks and the graph, and then any time you adjust the trade, you're doing the same thing. You take some notes, what's happened to the trade, why am I adjusting it, um, and then you take your before and after screenshots of the Greeks and the graphs, and then over a period of time, you've got this big um, database of trades that you can then look back on and if you've got a trade that's under pressure, you can go back and say, well, I remember a similar situation. You go back and look at it. Okay, I, okay, in the past I did this. It really didn't work. You know, this time I'll do something different. Okay. Um, yes, we're recording, so um, I'll be able to send the replay out to you guys. Uh, how do you normalize delta dollars? So, um, again, just looking at that total um, figure in, in um, comparison to your account size, and looking at the percentage, um, when I said normalizing delta dollars, I think I actually just meant normalizing delta. So we use delta dollars to normalize delta. So, you know, we might have delta of negative 50 on IWM, which, which might sound really, really high. Um, but if we look at Russell, we would have only delta of negative 5. Um, so if we look at that delta dollars number, the numbers are going to be similar. So we're using that to normalize. Uh, do you manually maintain trading diary and monitor delta? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I'm looking at these risk parameters every day. Um, you know, I might not necessarily write things down in my, in my journal every day, um, but any time I make an adjustment or a new trade, as I said, I'm taking those screenshots, I'm making notes. Um, okay. Uh, what should be the delta to theta ratio? Okay, so it depends on the strategy that you're trading and the instrument. So, the, 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 the 20 to 25 percent rule is for sort of a standard Russell monthly iron condor. Okay, now if you're trading IWM, again you've got to standardize or normalize that delta by looking at delta dollars and, and using that as a ratio. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how I do it and, and, you know, overall in terms of your total portfolio, 
delta to theta ratio, you want to keep it less than sort of that 25% level. You know, I'd let it go up to 30, um, maybe even slightly higher. Um, but you know, if it's getting up to 40 or 50%, um, in terms of delta dollars exposure and my theta, um, you know, I want to want to start to bring that down a little bit. Do long VIX trades or straddles on SPY make sense? Yeah, I mean, typically I've found that you know trading short vol is is the way to go. Um, you know, making money on long straddles can be quite hard because um, of the time decay that you're suffering. Unless you get really lucky and you put a trade on and within a couple of days the market sells off. Um, you know, I tend to use them more as a hedge. Okay, so I'm, I'm trading my condors still, um, my trapdoors and things like that, but I'm worried about a volatility spike. So I've got some um, long straddles on, on SPY or SPX or Russell um, as a little bit of a hedge. Uh, is there anything that we can do to hedge against a black swan event? So yeah, another good question. Look, not, not huge amounts. Um, you know, it depends on how much you want to pay for your insurance basically. So you can buy um, out of the money puts. Um, so what a lot, a lot of people do will buy, um, I think they call them units. So anything um, of, of delta around two uh, on the put side, um, you're buying those really, really deep out of the money puts. Um, you know, that'll give you a little bit of protection. It just depends how much you want to spend. Um, look, obviously those black swan events are a huge risk. To, to everyone, not just options traders, even just investors, okay? Um, but you know, there's lots of um, studies and white papers out there that you can read that sort of say paying for that insurance in the long run doesn't actually make sense, okay? Now, look, if you, if you go, you know, don't go out there and say, Gav didn't say to buy insurance, everything's gonna be okay, because um, that's not what I'm saying. But, you know, if you go out and put trades on tomorrow and there's a black swamp event, you know, that's going to be very bad. So if you want to have that insurance there, then yes, definitely go ahead and do it. And, you know, it's never going to be perfect. Um, you know, it might just offset your losses a little bit. You might still have some losses. Um, so you've got to keep that in mind as well. Um, but yeah, generally if you're sort of consistent and again, over time probabilities, um, those, those puts, that insurance is really, really inflated. And again, you know, I can send you some white papers if you want it. You know, you, you do case studies over 10, 20 years and, and generally the cost of that insurance um, is basically like, like paying your car insurance. You, you know, you, you're paying out money every year um, and you're hardly ever needing to use it. Um, you know, that's why insurance companies are in business. That's how they make money. Um, but again, you know, don't take this as me saying, um, you know, black swan events aren't going to hurt you as an options trader. Of course they're going to hurt. Um, and, and you've got to be careful um, by trading small um, and not exposing too much of your portfolio. Um, you know, that's why I'm quite conservative, generally have a fair bit of cash around, um, and, and hopefully that answers your question. Okay, so delta dollars, yep. Uh, the way to calculate it is literally just the delta times the price of the underlying. So this one we're looking at here, if we take negative 17, we times it by the price of the underlying, 1345.80, we get negative 23,000. So pretty simple um, calculation. Uh, what's a reasonable Vega theta ratio? So um, you probably wouldn't want to go above about 400%, so four to one. Um, okay, so here we've got theta of 207. You wouldn't want short Vega to be more than about 800 or so. So again, if it gets up above that level, you know, I want to be adding some long Vega in there to bring that Vega number down. Okay, so was the trapdoor sort of covered that. Uh, next training session, same time next week. Okay, so we've got one more session. We're gonna go through some, some trade examples. We'll go through, you know, trade initiation and adjustment and, and close. Um, and then also um, some things that I'm looking at for the remainder of the year. What delta level should you initiate adjustment? So typically if the delta of the short call or put hits about 25 and also that delta dollars level um, you know, for example, if you've got a condor and you're risking 20,000, um, another rule I would have that, you know, if it gets to sort of double that, I might start to look um, at adjusting. So if I'm risking 20,000 and then my exposure gets to 40,000 plus or minus, um, I'll look to adjust. 
Uh, do I take profits of 50% or wait till expiry? It really depends. Um, you know, a good rule of thumb is, you know, if I've made 50% of my profit and less than 50% of the um, time of the trade has passed, I'll take the profits. Um, but at the same time, if I'm right in the middle of the condor and there's very low risk, I might just keep it open. Um, okay. So it really depends. Yes, sometimes I will definitely take profits early, um, but I don't have you know exact specific rules for that other than that sort of time um, factor. Uh, gamma risk, probably a pretty big topic. Um, you know, I've got a post on that. If you just Google um, you know options trading IQ gamma risk, you can read that. That's probably the best thing there. Um, probably too maybe a little bit advanced and um, you know would take a bit too long to explain here. Uh, what criteria do you use when to start adjusting the side under pressure of an iron condor? Okay, so again, a couple of factors. The delta, let's say the market's going up. So I'm looking at the short call being under pressure. If it hits delta 20 or 25, I definitely want to adjust. I never want to let it get above 25 because losses start to snowball after that point. Um, you know, the 3% rule that I talked about um, and also the delta dollar rule. So I've got two or three different factors. You know, sometimes if one of those factors has been hit, I might leave it alone. Um, but if all three have been hit, I'm like, okay, definitely need to adjust now. Uh, since the iron condor is a strategy with a defined potential loss, why do we run it down rolling and adjusting? Is it worth a while? Um, not sure I really understand the question, but um, yeah, I mean, you, there's two kinds of adjustments. You can make aggressive adjustments or defensive adjustments. It depends what your, um, what your goal is. Okay. Yes, everything's recorded, so uh, I'll send that out. Uh, what time periods of the trade? So these examples were typically, um, yeah, around 30, 30 to 40 or, or so days to expiry. Um, as I said, uh, with a lot of my trades recently, I've been going out further in time, um, you know, 60 and even 90 days, and that's been working really, really well. All right, guys, great questions. That was really awesome. I hope you guys got a lot out of today's session. Um, as I said, we're back again next week. Um, so lots, lots more um, details to go through and just expanding on some of these concepts um, in a lot more detail, okay, and looking at specific examples with some of these trades that we've had. Um, you know, I'll walk you through um, the trades from initiation, to the adjustment points, why we adjusted, how we adjusted, and then how the trades worked out. Um, and then also, you know, some of the other things that I'm looking at for the remainder of the year. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you coming on. Good to see you here. Um, yes, those screens were Interactive Brokers Risk Navigator. Um, I've got some tutorials. If you just send me an email, um, Charles, I can send those to you. I've got three or four videos on YouTube that just sort of walk you through um, interactive brokers and how I use it. So that'll probably help you. That might be the best, just you know, 10, 15 minute videos. Um, so just shoot me an email and I'll send those through to you. Again, if you don't have copies of my books, um, you know, happy to send those to you guys for free. So just email them me through uh, the request there. Um, and otherwise, hope to see you guys next week. Thanks, David, as well. Um, thank you, Charles. Appreciate that. So, yeah, I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Um, as I said, lots, lots more good stuff to go next week. Um, so I hope to see you all then, and I'll talk to you soon.